science can seemingly answer any question for the human race, and the potential for technology to shape our lives for the better is virtually limitless. But science has yet to answer one very important question, how conscious beings like us can be solely the product of the unconscious matter and energy that surrounds us, what I call the consciousness gap. Without supernatural forces or an intelligent creator, we can explain the living world using genetics, chaos theory, evolution, mathematical biology and so on. Yet we still cannot account for how a carbon atom from a rock, which finds its way into the food chain and then into the tissue of the human brain, can generate consciousness. So this video gives my personal philosophical and logical answer to that question, as well as an answer to the measurement problem which is significantly different from observer effect explanations. I would say my view falls broadly into the category of a scientific or materialist panpsychism, the idea that whatever makes us conscious must be a, a basic property of our universe. However, all labels carry a baggage of interpretation, so for some panpsychism is a, a dualist philosophy, to others it's idealism, and many, many others wrongly assume that panpsychism means that rocks and chairs would have to be conscious in some way. So while in this video I will use the term panpsychism, I hope you will listen to my arguments rather than any preconceptions of what that term may mean for you. To have meaningful debate on any subject requires some common terms of reference. However, many of the discussions about consciousness you'll come across never actually attempt a definition of the word itself, as if we all know and agree on exactly what it means. Debate also usually centres around the most complex forms of conscious consciousness, uh, memory, abstract thinking, separation of subject and object and so on, instead of its basic evolutionary purpose of just keeping living beings alive. As the entry for consciousness in the 1989 Macmillan Dictionary of Psychology cautions, Many fall into the trap of equating consciousness with self-consciousness. To be conscious it is only necessary to be aware of the external world. So my own working definition of consciousness is an entity having some awareness of its circumstances and the potential to react in a way that is not essentially predictable. Now bear in mind I'm not discussing human inventions like artificial intelligence or whether a brain grown in a jar would have a personality. In this video I will only consider the physical forces of the natural world, the cells, animals and human beings on planet Earth that evolution has given rise to, in order to account for this consciousness gap. So in my definition the test of predictability focuses the debate by quickly ruling out say a simple programmed robot. Of course many scientists believe that everything we say and do is theoretically predictable because our world is governed by Newtonian classical physics. However that is a theoretical predictability. In the world that you and I inhabit, living beings like the weather, stock market, horse races and elections are not wholly predictable given current technology, and perhaps they never will be. So following my definition, a human, a dog and a mouse are all conscious entities, whereas a rock clearly is not. So a materialist or scientific panpsychism would explain the existence of consciousness like this. All conscious beings are made exclusively from the same atoms that compose the inanimate world around us and nothing more. So unless we accept that consciousness is separate from matter, dualism, then some kind of base consciousness must exist in every atom that makes up the material world. Consciousness would therefore be regarded as a building block of our universe along with matter and energy, and awareness of our universe, or at least some part of it, as a basic property of the universe itself, and not just a byproduct of the most evolved animals with the cleverest brains, such as humans. Now it's a principle that underlies many ancient spiritual traditions, as well as some New Age philosophies. However, these are often reduced to theism on the one hand or a kind of New Agey solipsism on the other. This is because it's very easy to obscure a simple logical principle with extra layers of interpretation, attaching stories and purposes in order to deal with the, the why of human existence, which is the religious realm, and therefore unscientific. So now with the middle part of this video, I'm going to examine three common assumptions in Western thought, which I believe make a materialist or scientific panpsychism 
problematic for scientists and philosophers alike. I think some believe that as genetics, neurology and technologies for mapping the human brain advance, the answer to what consciousness is will eventually just become apparent. Some neurological research has tried to pin down a location for consciousness somewhere in the cerebral cortex. But scientific materialism hasn't yet explained the consciousness gap. Now as the brain starts off as unconscious matter, it implies that there must be a, a sort of threshold where the brain structure is able to generate consciousness. On the face of it, this threshold explanation does seem quite reasonable. Matter in different states could have different properties, including the capacity to generate consciousness when atoms are arranged into a human brain. We have, after all, evolution, genetics and mathematical biology to explain most of what would happen leading up to this threshold. So the scientific exploration of consciousness is then concerned with how complicated a biological system is required for that to happen, and where in the brain exactly will we find it. However, from a strictly logical point of view, this does rather allow something, consciousness, to just appear and disappear from nothing, the unconscious rocks, trees and streams around us. It means that consciousness is spontaneously appearing in biological systems of an unspecified level of complexity, so the threshold of consciousness would exist at some arbitrary point. It implies that as the human brain develops, there must be a, a binary state switching, a transformation of unconscious matter to conscious matter. Which sounds a little like magic. For me, the alternative is a simpler and more credible starting point, which is that we are material beings in a material universe throughout which a basic awareness exists. So consciousness, whatever that is, is likely a basic property of that material world. Now this probably sounds rather abstract. If I were to relate this to the individual experience, I would describe what we call my consciousness as being a, a significant concentration of basic consciousness, which is largely but not exclusively in the synapses inside my skull. Now, if you misunderstand this, it may sound dualist. It may appear that I'm saying that consciousness is floating around different locations of the physical body and is therefore the infamous ghost in the machine. In fact, my point is the opposite. I don't accept dualist notions that consciousness is separated from matter. It's not hanging around out there in the universe somewhere waiting to pour into our bodies and brains as a temporary home. In common with most scientists, I believe that my consciousness is a product of my material body and brain in the material world, and it cannot exist without them. So actually I would say I'm arguing for a more strict physicalism and materialism. I'm putting basic consciousness in with matter, with all matter, and not just neurons that have reached a certain level of complexity and then magically switched themselves from unconscious to conscious matter. So consciousness, the ability to be aware, is inseparable from the energy and matter which composes your entire body. And the universe that surrounds us, therefore, is not simply a, a lifeless stage set made up of dead matter. So the second barrier to a credible scientific panpsychism is our inherited bias towards our own species. Our basic understanding of what it is to be human, to, to be an animal possessed of a self-aware consciousness, is still partly influenced by thousands of years of religious and cultural history, which means that both science and philosophy are still rather anthropocentric. We of course have a very different view of our environment to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, Early human religions were typically animistic, where humans saw themselves as an intrinsic part of nature. The monotheist religions like Judaism and Christianity then taught that only humans have souls. This made us special, removed us from the rest of the animal kingdom and kind of reduced nature to a, a scenic backdrop for our all-important destinies. The cerebral cortex is sometimes regarded as the, the pinnacle of intelligent evolution, as it is the home of the most complex parts of human consciousness. But we are not the only animal with these types of brain structures. 
nor the only animal with some capacity for abstract thought. So, for example, one test of abstraction is, can an animal recognise itself in a mirror? Now, not only can clever mammals such as primates, dolphins and elephants pass this test, but so do much smaller-brained Eurasian magpies. In recent years, studies have found that crows are very good at abstract problem-solving. Three-day-old chicks can do addition and subtraction, which is something humans won't grasp until they're three years old. Some ant species can not only choose the best tool for the job, they have arguably better teaching skills than highly social mammals meerkats because the ant teacher will respond to feedback from the pupil. Franz de Waal and Jane Goodall's work have found moral behaviour, fairness and even cruelty existing in primates, which is perhaps unsurprising as we share 98% of our DNA with chimpanzees. Studies have hinted at a concept of mind in ravens, apes and deliberate deception in dogs and humpback whales have been documented to altruistically help seals escape from killer whales. Now these are just some of the abilities and traits that humans have long claimed are solely the preserve of our species, and many of these studies were conducted within the last 10 years. Until relatively recently, the idea that other animals might experience emotions or have cognitive abilities that would be found in humans was quite likely to be dismissed as unscientific anthropomorphizing. That view is changing in the scientific community with more research. And in fact, in a May 2017 edition of The New Scientist, one respected researcher suggested that any animal that needs to sleep may have a degree of self-awareness. Now that would include many animals that lack complex brain structures like the human cerebral cortex. So as a species, maybe we should ask ourselves the question, why has it taken until the start of the 21st century to consider whether a dog can anticipate our behaviour? is worthy of scientific study. Now it's important to understand that I'm not trying to anthropomorphise animal intelligence. Other animals do not experience life as we do. Humans have a kind of unique combination of the, these modules of consciousness, abstract thought, social cooperation, tool use, etc., that have allowed us to shape our world in a way that, that no other animal could. Instead, I am challenging the assumption that humans have any kind of X factor of consciousness, any kind of fundamental difference that elevates us above the rest of the animal kingdom. This has been a long-held assumption in much of Western thinking, and it's never really made any sense to me. And the scientific research is now showing that it is something of a myth. So our concept of what counts as intelligent consciousness and where it can be found really needs a fundamental revision due to more detailed explorations of animal behaviour. And this also means shifting the philosophical and scientific inquiry into consciousness away from, from purely human existence and the, the human cerebral cortex. The third barrier to a credible scientific panpsychism is that the debate usually centres on the most complex forms of consciousness. Creating a hierarchy of consciousness with basic brain functions at the bottom, emotions sandwiched in the middle, and then the, the clever abstract cerebral cortex abilities up at the top. Let's consider just one of these higher abilities, self-awareness. Now at birth we have an emerging but a, a very limited sense of self. A baby is largely reactive. Selfhood is learned as our brains and bodies develop. Recognising oneself in the mirror starts somewhere around the age of two, although this is culturally specific and can be much later in less visual cultures. The philosophical and psychological self grows through childhood until, at some point, the question is likely to emerge in our minds, if I am looking at the world, who or what is inside my head witnessing that image? Now, in contrast to a human baby, a newborn dolphin must swim, recognise its mother's signature whistle and have a, a very good awareness of its marine environment within minutes of birth. At risk from predators, it must very quickly function as a dolphin. Adult dolphins exhibit complex social behaviours and pass the mirror test, and their brains contain a larger proportion of cerebral cortex than ours. We cannot know how much selfhood cetaceans have, of course, but we have the luxury of acquiring our selfhood relatively slowly. A sense of separation between oneself and the world does not appear to be needed by humans immediately after birth. However, this lack of selfhood does not diminish the newborn baby's status as a complex conscious being. 
So for me, the distinction between awareness and self-awareness is one of proportion rather than binary states of existence. Perhaps we need a bit of a dose of pragmatism about the modules of consciousness which we possess. Language, abstract thought, perception of time, moral behaviour and so on. Treat these as something that consciousness just does, rather than mistaking it for what consciousness is. Although self-awareness has been key to human success, it could have some evolutionary value to a large number of species. Now all we can ever know about the consciousness of other animals are the observed effects, the action and reaction, the stimulus and the response, so we can only ever estimate levels of consciousness from measurement and observation. So it's even possible that all living consciousness includes some tiny degree of self-awareness. Now I doubt that an amoeba has a mental image of itself or any kind of personal history. It has a very limited range of options compared to a human. But we cannot categorically say that whatever rudimentary awareness the amoeba possesses does not include a thousandth participle sense of self, because as was discovered in the 1950s, amoeba move away uh, towards food and away from danger, so its observed behaviour is one of self-interest. We can't predict the exact path that an amoeba or any other animal will take in moving away from a threat, so in that sense, and using my earlier definition of consciousness, the awareness of circumstances and the ability to react which is not essentially predictable. It is there in all animals, and that includes the humble amoeba. Incidentally, evolution also addresses one of the main misconceptions of any panpsychic philosophy, that inanimate objects like rocks and chairs would need to be conscious. Evolution means that humans and animals have an interest in staying alive and preserving a healthy body. Our awareness and self-awareness assist with that evolutionary purpose, but a rock can still be composed of atoms that have energy, matter and base consciousness. It's just that when they're arranged into a rock, there is no rock consciousness aiming to preserve its existence as a rock rather than as a pile of rock dust. With evolution, human and animal existence have an implicit motivation and intention that a, a rock or a chair could simply never have. So is a scientific panpsychism just an interesting theory, or is there actually any evidence for a self-aware universe? Perhaps in the greatest paradox of modern science there just might be. Now I'm very aware that mentioning the measurement problem in any discussion of consciousness is, is quite likely to be the point at which many scientists would just switch off. Too often a kind of new age or religious perspective is invoked with quantum mechanics and a kind of a black hole of solipsism just opens up and swallows up any useful argument. However, with the type of panpsychism I'm describing, I believe a simple logical interpretation is possible without belief in astrology or past life regression or requiring years of meditation study. In case you're not familiar with it, I've added a link to Dr. Jim Al-Khalili's excellent explanation below. Now, the measurement problem is rather the Achilles heel of physics, because it shows that the universe cannot always be observed in complete objectivity. The experiment and its interpretations are so counterintuitive, it is easy to lose sight of its real-world results. And these are firstly that particles behave differently when given a, a choice of slots to pass through, rather than when they have only the one option. And secondly, they exhibit different behaviours depending on whether or not a genuine act of measurement is taking place. So my earlier definition of consciousness, the ability to be aware and have a reaction that isn't wholly predictable, is applicable to the measurement problem. The particle's behaviour, creating an interference pattern when given a choice of slots and then stopping doing so when being measured, would suggest some awareness if we were observing the actions of a person, or maybe an animal, going through a maze. There is unpredictability because we don't know exactly where each particle will land, even if we can predict that an interference pattern will result. So to me, the double-slit experiment suggests that awareness is built into the fabric of the universe at the most basic level, and because there is no clear dividing line between awareness and self-awareness, by awareness, I do mean the basis of consciousness. Now, this interpretation has a significant difference from observer-effect interpretations, where it is claimed that the 
presence of the conscious observer is influencing the experiment. In 2000, it was hoped that the delayed choice quantum eraser experiment would settle this question once and for all. The problem is that materialists claim the quantum eraser proves there is no observer effect, whereas others believe that it is evidence in favour of the observer effect. However, for me, the whole observer effect question again assumes that consciousness must all be about human experience. My approach is to consider the experiment from the particle standpoint, and whether or not you believe in the observer effect, what is certain is that subatomic particles are behaving differently when presented with different circumstances, one slit or two, measurement taken or not taken, which could be evidence of the most basic level of awareness in our universe. Now I recognise for many this is a considerable philosophical shift, and understand that I am not suggesting that electrons have invisible brains making decisions, the brain-body pairing is specific to larger animal consciousness. But in fact, even in the living world a brain is not required for basic awareness, so slime mould for example made up of simple organisms can learn to navigate a maze, anticipate future events and choose the food that suits it best. And all this awareness takes place in one of the simplest forms of life imaginable, with no brain and no central nervous system. So if there is a very basic awareness in the very simplest forms of life made only of atoms and energy, how early does unconscious matter cross the threshold of consciousness? Oh, perhaps because I'm talking about particles and not animals, I should invent some clumsy term like proto-consciousness or awareness potential. But these would really just be semantic tricks enlisted because the word consciousness is associated with higher functioning human experience rather than its basic evolutionary purpose of keeping an animal alive. From a panpsychic point of view, the term consciousness is one of those terms that can be used both in the general and in the specific. So for example, we give energy specific labels for its different forms Yet underneath it is the same stuff, energy, that both holds an atom together and drives millions of gallons of water over a waterfall. So for me it's simpler to conceive of a basic awareness being present in every atom than a threshold of complexity be having to be crossed in the formation of your brain structure, which then permits clever consciousness to just spontaneously pop up from a load of dead matter. Now, quantum theory already encompasses multiple universes, time-travelling particles and spooky at a distance quantum entanglements, so is it really that outlandish to consider that the basic nature of the universe might just include its own awareness, and then assess the reasons for taking that position? Now, my account of the measurement problem should also not be confused with some new agey idea of getting the universe to, to do your bidding. This is not about helping you to get a new job or partner or helping you to win the lottery. Recognising that base awareness plays a part in the outcome does not mean that people can use their minds to direct the particle's trajectory any more than they can just manifest the perfect partner into their lives. However, it is possible that with very little of the normal material world present, the quantum double slit experiment is presenting us the universe stripped back to its bare essence and is therefore a context in which we can glimpse the operation of its own awareness. Supposing we could get our hunter-gatherer brains around awareness and consciousness being inseparable from energy and matter, what problems might that solve? Could it even be incorporated into the mathematics that describe our world? It seems at least worth considering doing the math where the universe's own awareness could playing a part. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that existing interpretations of the measurement problem are wrong, but I do believe that a scientific panpsychic interpretation will eventually have to join the list of possible interpretations because it is not only logically simple, it simultaneously bridges that, that consciousness gap between living beings and the material universe. So what might a materialist or scientific panpsychism have to say about our purpose here on Earth, about religion, or the soul or reincarnation? Briefly, I would say that to me it has no bearing, although I say more on this in the consciousness gap post I've linked to below. I am not in any way a spiritual teacher. 
I personally don't believe in an individual soul or reincarnation or an afterlife. For those who do, I would say the soul and the consciousness are not the same thing. I myself do not have a faith, so I, I know of no purpose to our existence beyond evolution. But I recognise that faith can be a positive force in many people's lives. For some, a material universe that lacks a higher purpose is cold and empty. For me, if there is a more spiritual purpose in materialist or scientific panpsychism, it would be to give our constantly evolving hunter-gatherer brains a, a greater sense of being at home in the universe. A sense of being at home, a sense of belonging, really needs no purpose other than itself. Now, as well as lacking a definition of consciousness, I've noticed that many discussions will use the phrase the mystery of consciousness, which is something you'll notice I've avoided in this video. I think this reflects the unnecessary mythology that frequently surrounds human consciousness. While neurology and the subjectivity of our experience are fascinating topics, to me the actual existence of consciousness in our material world has always been very unmysterious and very, very matter of fact. I think many materialists may be unwilling to consider a kind of panpsychic view because they fear it might open up a kind of Pandora's box of unproven ideas, for example the collective unconscious or telepathy or telekinesis. Now while consciousness being a basic property of the universe might just increase the, the theoretical possibility of these things, it's not a valid reason for rejecting the logical arguments for panpsychism. The test of something unproven like telepathy is whether it can be proven by repeated experiment, which it is not, not whether there is another related theory that might just add some kind of theoretical weight to its existence. Ultimately, our understanding of the universe is and always will be limited by the capacity and structure of our hunter-gatherer brains. Using consciousness to understand consciousness is the mental equivalent of standing between two opposing mirrors to avoid confusion, you must make allowances for the infinite reflections surrounding you. Returning to my original definition of consciousness, an entity having some awareness of its circumstances and the potential to react in a way that is not essentially predictable, is really only acknowledging that we inhabit a living universe. And that's hardly a surprising concept as we ourselves are a product of a natural world which is composed only of atoms, yet quite obviously living. <laughs>